this workshop to work. And first item tonight is still the option of the proposed agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, motion second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. We have minutes from a March 19th, 2024 regular meeting and two consent items. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Here not all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Brings us to our item number three, which is a sale of city owned property authorization for upset bid uh, process. Anthony will present this, okay. Get where we need to be on the slides for a second. There you go. There we go. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I have the pleasure of presenting to you an opportunity for us to sell potentially a, a large portion of the Jacksonville Business Park. Uh, as many of us know, it's looked about like this for quite some time, and in fact, the, the city acquired this property originally in 1997, right, John? And, and about a year and a half, two years ago, we approached council with an idea to improve the site, hopefully to make it a little bit more appealing for future development. And at that time, council uh, allowed us to move forward with that concept. We secured some grant funds, and even though it looks kind of like a mud hole right there, um, it's actually very green right now. The, the ducks and the deer have finally stopped eating all the grass. But you can see it's all cleared, it's rough graded. We've got two very large stormwater ponds that will accommodate 80% impervious surface on the site. And on the bottom left hand side there, you can just barely see where the new roadway connection goes out to Gum Branch Road. So fast forward to where we are today, some good news is that the value of the land has increased, although that wasn't really our primary goal. You know, the primary goal was to activate the site, generate some interest in someone coming in to do some, some really good development. But uh, keep an eye on that, uh, uh, keep that 157 number in your mind because that's going to be important here in, in just a second as we move into the potential sale terms. So with us tonight, we have Ben Sherry from Suncap. And as you recall, several months ago, we, we talked about the opportunity to potentially sell the property in closed session and you authorized us to begin negotiations. And where we are today is we have a purchase and sale agreement that would transition or the transaction would include approximately 18 and a half acres of the total site total site being a little bit more than 30 acres, so wouldn't be the whole thing. There still would be some left over for us to develop with an anticipated sales price of $2.919 million. Okay, the number I mentioned to you before, the, the 157,000 is very important because that's how we go about determining what the total sales price is going to be. Uh, if council authorizes us to continue to move forward uh, with this process, uh, we will get a survey done. We'll continue working with SunCap to determine exactly what they need. And then the total final acreage will be multiplied by that 157 to get the total closing price. So this is shown in the agreement right now, but those words approximately and anticipated are very important. Uh, in the end, what they're most interested in is the net usable acreage that they need for their project. So putting that into graphical form, you can see my crayon art here. The yellow is what we currently have identified as the 18.5 acres. You can see there's still a good portion of the property um, that would remain under city control. Uh, they do not intend to purchase the ponds, and we feel that that's a good thing because we constructed those uh, to be regional facilities for the entire site. Um, and there we'll have uh, you know, a footprint on both sides of the road. And I kind of drew in where the, uh, the roadway extension 
now goes by the YMCA out towards Gum Branch Road. So given where we are and what the project consists of, we determined that we must go through the upset bid process. And of course, uh, Mr. Carter's been with us along the whole way to advise us on what the actual process is and, and how we do that in a legal way. It requires a 5% deposit. Um, if council, of course, all of this is if council authorizes us to take the next step. But the 5% deposit, we'll have to run an advertisement in the newspaper for 10 days. That opens the upset bid period by which somebody who submits a qualifying bid, and you can see the, the, two, um, the two measures of a qualifying bid, if they submit it during that 10 days, then we continue going until we get to the end of the 10 days and have the highest responsive, responsible bidder. Okay. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the 10%, so for it to be a qualifying bid, it has to be 10% greater than the first thousand dollars of the sales price and then 5% greater of the remainder. So we can do the math on that, but that's just how the law is set up. And again, it has to be the highest responsive, responsible bidder. At the end of the process, if we don't like we are, and don't like where we are, the general statute does allow us to reject all bids. Now, another thing that's important about the upset bid process is that we have to sell the property at fair market value, and that's where the 157 number comes in. So, again, if we move forward under the current provisions, the city's responsibility would be to provide a survey an Alta survey, which is just a, a standard survey that has various, you know, required components to it. We would go through the subdivision process, which is an administrative process here with planning and inspections. Uh, but most importantly, we would work with SunCap on stormwater treatment and, and maintenance arrangements. Now, in the agreement that was in your package, there are two different options. One is they can choose to treat the stormwater on their property if they would like, um, basically not utilizing the regional stormwater system, or they could enter into an agreement with the city to share in the cost of long-term maintenance of those, of those stormwater facilities. It's a very common thing in, in um, development like commercial subdivisions and, and the like. So the expected outcome, and, and got to be careful here because we do have disclosure agreements in place, but we do expect a sizable site investment, a capital site investment that would include a large building, parking, and other various amenities that go along with the with the operation. They would they would have both full and part time jobs on site. Uh, again, a pretty sizable operational fleet. And uh, the end user of this would provide a service that many in the region utilized. And by having this location here in Jacksonville, uh, we would expect folks from all over the region to have an improved level of service. So that's about as far as I can go right now, but the benefits are pretty considerable. So the recommendation at this point is for council to consider approving the offer to purchase uh, and also adopt the resolution to start the upset bid process. Uh, those are the two actions that would be needed for us to get into the 10 day uh, notification period and, and continue forward with the process. So those are the high notes here and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Council, any questions? Thank you, Anthony. Yes. Let me say just a word or two, Mr. Baird. <clears throat> Anthony did a great job coming to highlights, but as you know, there were grant funds that were given to the city to build these two stormwater ponds. There are obligations that we have under those grants, but there, uh, the belief is that uh, the retained property will be able to hopefully satisfy those obligations, but that's something yet to, to be determined. Also, if you looked at your agenda, Exhibit A to the agreement has, and you can see there are some wetlands there. 
The type of survey is called an ATLA survey, as an American title land association survey. And that survey uh, will show wetlands, it will show topography, it will show power lines, it will show any structures, et cetera. It's a very comprehensive survey. So it will be based upon that survey as to whether uh, this group Suncap, what amount they want to buy. But clearly from just looking at that map, you can see there's a little bit of wetlands there, and we hope they buy it all. But there are some, and so as Anthony said, it may not reach that exact figure. We're hoping it will become very, very close to that. Uh, we have, if council approves this, crafted an ad, because you can see it's just not an X amount for Y amount of money. So we've crafted an ad to put the public on notice, and that would run on Thursday in the paper. The uh, storm... Uh, then, of course, we would hope to have this back to you, and the plan would be to have it back to you on the 16th to uh, confirm the sale if that's what you want to do. Uh, stormwater is yet to be worked out. There's a lot of uh, intricacies there, but it's believed that, that they will want to work with the city or the, whether it's the city running the stormwater utility or whether it's a property owner's association that runs the stormwater utility would yet have to be determined. There are, as Anthony said, there's several... Uh, developments in town, one of them would be Academy Sports, and I can think off the top of my head, where they actually have a property owners association stormwater uh, facility there that does off-site treatment for all of those different little restaurants uh, along the front there, and all goes to that big pond in the back. These two ponds are there, so there would be, as he said, a proration of cost each year, whether it's the property owners association or whether it's the city and your fee schedule. There would be some cost incurred as to what, uh, there are maintenance costs for these stormwater uh, ponds and apparatuses. But uh, this land, as Anthony said, was basically given for some consideration that was given to the, uh, some other uh, developers back in the 97 and 98. There are no restrictions on the land. Uh, the two parcels that have been conveyed out, one is to uh, a predecessor in Tybal, but now it's where the orthopedic clinic is, and where the other one is Miller Mott. Neither of those uh, have, were done under kind of an economic development. And I know we've talked to council in uh, sessions about economic development, and we've looked at that. We we're not able to make the numbers work for this to be an economic development uh, proposition at this moment in time, depending... De uh, based upon what the developers are telling us they want to do. So that's why it's coming to you tonight as far as a pure upset bid process. And we want to make sure you understand that. And if any questions you have, uh, please, please ask us. Uh, of course, you have until the 16th. You can always reject this bid. Or, you, again, there may be another bid that comes forward. Yes, sir. You mentioned about the grants. What was, what was the situation with the grants? The, you, the, you have two ponds there and a road that was extended out. <coughs> grant money. So two grants, and Anthony can talk better about this, but why don't you do that, Anthony? So the, we use various types of grants in order to make the improvements. And, and over time, as the land develops out, we have to report back to those grantors as to what's built and you know whether the outcomes meet the intent of the original grant. Uh, in this particular case, we feel that this project does meet a lot of those intents by being a large capital investment, providing some employment, you know, and then just creating economic stimulus for the overall, for the overall community. Uh, but that's something that we'll have to monitor over time. And like, like Mr. Carter was saying, you know, th there's still about a third of the property left that we can continue to pursue uh, the, the economic um, measures, you know, that the, the, re the requested outcomes from all of those grants. The grants were pursued by the city. So initially the grants were pursued by Joanne, and then we actually inherited those grants as we took on the took on the responsibility of building the improvements. So but we're administering those. Right? We are, yes, sir. And we, we've been in very close contact with the grantors. I don't think there's a very high level of concern over the grant money, but it's something that we definitely need to monitor over time. And it can, of course, help, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, guide your decision making as we look to sell other portions of the property in the future. What's the remaining acreage? 55 something? Uh, it's somewhere around 15, 16, somewhere around that. Yeah. Two other points, Mayor, that I would make that if the council approves this tonight, then uh, 
the Sun Cap Corporation will pay into the clerk's hand an uh, earnest deposit in accordance with the statute that Anthony has told you about. And that amount is going to be 145961 They have a 120-day due diligence period, which they can get extended by putting other monies with a title insurance company. That won't increase the deposit they've made with the clerk. Three other extensions for 20, 45, 45 days, with three 45-day extensions. Well, all the indications I get, this company is anxious to move forward, and hopefully those extensions won't be necessary to to do, but I wanted to put that out there uh, for you. Some of that due diligence is actually happening on site today. <clears throat> we did allow for them to have an early entry onto the site. That way we could kind of compress that timeline because they are very interested in making this happen soon. Any other questions? You're being asked to uh, approve the uh, offer to purchase and a resolution for upset new process. Any motion? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We have three discussion items here. We'll start with our FY25 budget scheduling and presentation. Thank you, Mayor. You have in front of you your proposed FY25 budget. Uh, this is right on schedule with what we wanted to present to you on April 2nd. Uh, I think our team's done a very good job of putting the document together and getting it to you so that council has plenty of time to review and consider. Uh, the process changes just slightly this year. We are uh, going through the same uh, format where staff provides input after council gives us the initiatives and the direction. And then the one change you'll see on the calendar that's, that's in front of you and on the screen is we're moving the public hearing up to the next council meeting, which is April 16th. We feel that it's better to give citizens the opportunity to comment on the front end and then for you to receive that instead of having that in May during the council consideration time. So the uh, public hearing has been advertised and it will happen at the next council meeting, April 16th. And then we have the next two meetings scheduled for uh, additional discussion by council. On the 16th, we will have discussion on the items within the budget. On the 7th, we'll have discussion set up for those uh, for other uh, review processes and then on the 21st any additional discussion obviously the may 21st is what we've scheduled originally on our budget calendar for council to consider adoption if you'd like to schedule additional workshops in between those dates we can schedule those or if we need to go into june to schedule dates after that we can make those uh, meetings occur. So uh, that's the schedule. Any questions on the schedule? May 7th is going to be difficult for me. So I would think we can move that around some kind of way. Okay. Schedule wise, pretty consistent with what we presented to you at the beginning of the process. When you go in your books, the only thing I want to go over is just the format. So you, you have the book, it um, has the message right up front as we had last year, and then you're going to have the breakdowns on funds. Uh, you'll have a few pages there that will show you a general fund breakdown. It'll give you fund balance. It'll give you each individual fund summary. And then when you get over past... Um, page 24, which is a, a blank white page on your left. The next page is going to be the white papers that we presented to you last year, and those are going to have employee compensation plan and personnel. You'll see those changes that are earmarked so that we're drawing attention to those for you. Then the next one on the white paper side will be page three. That's the capital improvement plan that Wally and Sabrina presented to us uh, two previous meetings. Then we go into the annual action plan, the community outreach. Uh, that breaks down what Tracy's team is doing with the uh, uh, 
five-year consolidated plan and this year's annual action plan. What we added to that section is what we call the uh, community outreach total so that when you're looking at the dollars that are going outside of city operations directly, you have a total community support funds for FY25 at $2.7 million. That ties in everything that we're doing with CDBG, general fund community outreach, uh, general fund projects, and then some other community funded projects that council has considered. You'll see at the bottom of that page four, uh, the YMCA is listed. We have it listed and in the budget we have it as $1.5 million. The item that council originally approved on this plan, even though we don't have that final agreement, was three years at a million dollars each year. So as we go through the process, Council will make the decision, we either go ahead and fully fund that now at 1.5 and wrap it up, or you stick with the three-year plan and we do a million, a million, and a million. So this would be either year two of two or year two of three. And so that impacts the total community support. Right below that, you'll see the funds for one place, $333,000. That was also uh, council-driven. And then you're going to see some other um, community-oriented funds that council appropriates every year. Uh, one, one thing you'll see is the uh, United Way of Onslow County and Onslow Community Outreach, we have opioid support funds. So these are things that we've talked about through the year and we put that in to the system. So we're looking at how we're utilizing and maximizing the utility of the opioid support funds um, as we're trying to make an impact. So then you flip over, we do have the fee schedule, which we've talked about briefly, but we list out the items in the fee schedule that we like to highlight for council. That includes the water and sewer rate increases of 2.25%. That includes the residential sanitation of $4 per month, plus some other sanitation fees. It also drew attention to the fire inspection increases that are associated with the changes in North Carolina state statute for the year, and then some planning and inspection fees. So that's included in the back of your book, please take the time to look through those so that when we get to that discussion, if you've got questions specifically, we can look at that. If you go over to page seven of this section, it's the equipment replacement plan. Uh, what we want to do is highlight that for council and for the community so that you see where those equipment needs are. Hopefully what you see is they're consistent year over year in the items that we're looking at. And then we flip over to the last white paper page. It's going to be page eight. And it's, again, the resiliency of government. The comment that I would make there for the council is remember that we're not budgeting for uh, natural disasters. We're not budgeting for um, even dignitary appearances, things of that nature that would come outside of the normal operating budget. We utilize the fund balance for any kind of response. So if these things happen, rest assured, our teams are ready and prepared and trained to respond. And if there are items that we need to bring back to council after the fact to consider any kind of budget allocations, we'll bring that to you <coughs> as a request that you'll consider at the time. We just don't want to pad the budget with those numbers so that, uh, that, that it looks like it's different year over year. And since last year we took that uh, those areas out. We're going to do the same this year unless council tells us to do something different. So then format wise after that you're going to go through the fund budgets, the departmental budgets, and then at the end you're going to have the fee schedule all included. Uh, so, so the request is flip through it when you have questions outside of a meeting. If you want to Call, email those. If you email something or you call in, we'll respond back to the entire council with responses. If you want to come in and spend time looking through the budget uh, as a whole in terms of uh, any areas that you may have highlighted, just let me know. We'll schedule the time so we can walk through it. If you want to buy me a sandwich and look at it, you can definitely <laughs> bring a sandwich in for me and we'll look at that. <laughs> schedule you for tomorrow, Mr. Bittner. We'll just go ahead and... Uh, I like most sandwiches, but, but the goal here is to give you the, the book now to review and then come back and be prepared for April 16th for any questions that we'll go through. For public, mm -hmm. the, info, the budget will be on the web tomorrow. It'll be posted Top tomorrow. In City Hall and the, the library. Mm -hmm. 
I think last year we had three other. I think we had three copies out there. I think we took one down to recreation last year uh, to the office there. But either way, we'll make sure we have them and it'll be posted online so that people know where they can come and get a hard copy at. Um, and then people want to make copies of the budget, they can do that here at City Hall as well. So encourage anyone that asks a budgetary question, if they don't have a hard copy, encourage them to either go onto the website tomorrow or to come in and take a look at what we've had pr printed. Any questions on the format? Sure. That's all we have on that, Mayor. Okay. Next, we have a you know, recreation and parks master plan update. May I give you a lead up while, while Sarah is coming up? We have, uh, we've been going through this process for uh, looking at multiple issues within the community. One of the things that when we started our process for the 400 acre sports complex discussion was let's maximize the team and look at recreation and parks master plan at the same time so that we can get plenty of input. And so, go ahead, man. Okay, I'm sorry. So, part of what uh, Sarah Burroughs and, and Sage has come in to do is guide us through this process so that we're not just accomplishing one feat, designing out a, a master plan development, but we're looking at the entire community. Because, uh, you know, our focus is even though anything we do on the 400 acres is a large investment, it's not the only investment that we're gonna make over the next 10, 20 years, plus or minus. So, uh, so that's where we're at. Sarah has about 300 slides, so <laughs> hope you brought that sandwich, Mr. Bittner, because <laughs> I'm handing her the clicker now. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, did you have something you wanted to? No, no. Okay, all right, um, thank you. My name is Sarah Burroughs with Sage Design, and I have had the privilege to work with um, your staff and your community um, at the start of the 400-acre tract efforts as of last summer. It's a really um, quick-paced, comprehensive master planning process, so I can't thank your staff enough for um, staying on top of it, getting feedback, and helping engage the community throughout this process. My goal today is to give you an overview of the report of which you guys should have digitally. Um, to understand the framework and the content and how we got to the findings in that report and give you time to review it and come back to us with any questions and we'll come back to you at a future meeting um, to seek adoption and approval. So that our goal today is really just to inform you of where we are in the process and, and make sure you don't have any questions along the way and understand how we have the content set up. Um, so the process really went hand in hand with the efforts that you had with the 400 acre tract. Um, the purpose of this plan is to build upon staff efforts that you did in 2021 and follow best practices to set your community up um, for grant funding with the Parks and Recreation Trust Fund and Land and Water Conservation Fund. And it merges those two efforts so that you have a really solid understanding of what's in your system and what your community wants and where those gaps may exist. And so this will help set you up for that and build on um, the efforts that you've already undertaken. Those best practices um, require you to follow certain steps in your comprehensive planning system. Um, they really, you know, basic things like understanding what you have and, and by that, it's not just the quantity and the content of what's in your system as far as parks and ball fields, but it's the condition of those things. And are those things meeting best practices and the distribution of those things? And can your community reach the, the information that they need online and can they get to your facility? So that inventory is really understanding a lot more than just the quantity of what you have in your system. And I applaud the uh, applaud Jacksonville for the efforts with community engagement. Um, we don't often find streamlined efforts when you go out and you do a statistically valid survey. We did National Night Out, we came here, we talked with community members in your parks, um, there was the tourism um, information done by Victus and with the 400 acre track and it was it was it was really nice to look at the data and the results and find things streamlined and aligned 
Um, that doesn't always happen, but it's been a very engaged process, which for you as a council is excellent because it's a community-guided and supported document. The information we have in here has come from your community. And so that's, that's a really great step forward for you in order to be able to follow the recommendations and findings in here. We take that information into analysis phase, um, and I'm gonna go over those steps in a little bit more detail. And at the end of the report, you'll find the action items and recommendations. And this is not, we're not saying go out and do all of this this year. This is a guide for you over the next 10 years. Best practices states you'll reevaluate this in 10 years. Um, and that really helps you understand where you are. If you have things which we did find in your plan from 10 years ago that may still need to be um, implemented, those move up higher in your recommendations list. And so that's part of the process um, of reviewing and adopting the findings in this. Um, again, this is just the information we went through and we looked at everything in your system and where it was and what master plans you have in place for transportation. Um, these are just some of the highlights of the elements you have within your system. Um, you've, you've done a really good job. Your last plan 10 years ago talked about adding more trails and more mileage. You have done that. That demand still exists, and so that's something that needs to continue. Um, you've made a really great effort to move forward with improvements to your playground. You have a lot in your system, and those improvements continue to happen. Um, there are some things that we noticed from a, a local, state, and national comparative um, perspective like dog parks and skate parks and pools where there is a gap and those things you're already moving forward with with your partnerships and conversations with the YMCA. So again, these things help you benchmark where you are as a city um, to understand where you need to be. Part of that inventory process is distribution. Um, and this really is one of the things I wanted to highlight with your 400 acre tract is that you know you have um, rectangular fields, but they're all in one, they're all in one place. And so we need to look at expanding the access to some of those things. You have um, facilities, you have some indoor facilities, but they're smaller. And so we need to look at increasing access to indoor space that accommodates the type of indoor activities people would like to have. Um, playground distribution is another one we've talked to um, uh, staff about and you know there are you have wonderful playgrounds we need to look at continuing to improve those and increasing access to those features throughout the com community um, I just did want to take a step back with some of the community engagement priorities because that helps guide us in our recommendations when we started this process we asked your community and your stakeholders and your staff what's important and the three that really came forward were economic development health and wellness and arts and culture so as we move forward with the action items and recommendations, we use this theme language, um, and that's consistent with how the report is written. So I just wanted to highlight that when you go through and look at the, the report itself. The community engagement was really robust, and so we have surveys from ETC, we have um, conversations from National Night Out, we have the um, survey from Victus, we have all of that information pulled together and we looked at the common themes from all of that input and these are just some of the highlights. I do want to kind of pull out a few of those. 84% um, positivity on parks and quality in your community is incredibly high from a national standard and so I think that is really something you really need to continue to highlight um, because that's above the national average. Um, you're reaching your users through social media 67% of your users and your community are getting information from social media. 25% is the national average. So you guys are doing a great job getting the word out um, in a multiple, um, multiple platforms. So um, that's a great thing. I, I did want to highlight desire for pool. When you look at, if you go back and you look at the attachments with the ETC survey, that'll be up at the top, but you're already moving forward with those efforts. So. Um, some of the things that are really unique in Jacksonville is that demand for adventure recreation. You have a young community compared to other communities in the state, um, and there's really high demand for intergenerational adventure outdoor activities, and that's something that comes forward much higher here in Jacksonville than I've seen in other communities in the state. Um, walking and biking 
is number one, and it will stay number one for quite a while, I think. Um, and then from programs, people love your special events. Your staff does, does an amazing job providing these um, resources. Your movies, your sledding, your teen center, a lot of different things that you're doing here that are great. When we get into the recommendations, I want you to keep that in mind because the demand for that is really high, and there's some um, continued conversations you're going to have to have about benchmarking and where you want to be in order to provide more programs. I got a question. Yes. So you are reaching users through social media, 67 percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you measure that? We found that out in the survey. So we sent out a statistically valid survey that went out to representative um, community. It represents your community. And that came back through that survey. What was the number of individuals that responded? Um, it was way over 400. Way, yeah, it was, it was over the required amount for the statistical response. So, yeah. Um, when we get into the analysis, um, when you get into this section of the report, I just wanted to highlight how this works. So the 2023 NRP Agency Performance Review is a national database mechanism that communities use to <clears throat> see where they sit in comparison to other communities. Um, this database has grown significantly in the last 10 years since your last master plan, and it is a phenomenal resource of information across the country. So it's a great benchmark for you. When you go in and you look at that data, it's broken down using your population. So there's benchmarks for each different population category. So you're not going in and comparing yourself to a major metropolitan area. You're benchmarking against communities that fall within the 50,000 to 99,000 range. And so you're not comparing yourself to a smaller community. You're not comparing yourself to a larger community. The benchmarks that we're discussing in here are of like size throughout the entire country. And the database is really comprehensive. So it's a very good benchmarking measure. The second part of that is you fit in the upper quartile, the median, and the lower. In our report, we discuss where you fit within the median. Are you above that? Are you below that? There's not a right or wrong answer. It's you, your decision as a, a council in a community where you want to fit in that. If there is something that is in high demand, we recommend you look at the median to the upper quartile for meeting your benchmarking. If, you, if it's something that's not in high demand, then that's not something that's quite as critical. So as you look at that benchmarking, these aren't finite numbers you have to meet. It's a guide for you to understand where you sit across the country with your services that you're providing to understand if you're providing a level of service for your community. So all of these come through with how many people per population you should be serving in that benchmark. And so I just wanted to pull a few highlights, and you'll see this in the report. So um, right now, Greenways and Trails was a really good example, 19 miles you're providing right now. Well, Greenways and Trails are really in high demand right now. So you're meeting that median, you're set at that benchmark now, but your community is continuing to grow and that's in high demand. So as you move forward, those are conversations you need to have as far as increasing those services. Uh, same with rectangular fields, that was another one. You're, you're meeting it right now, but you're growing. And so if you look at the next two years and five years and 10 years, if you stay where you are now, you will not continue to meet that because these continue to grow. So um, some of the lower quartile elements are um, playgrounds, dog parks, splash pads, large indoor recreation space, which I think is one of the critical ones. Um, and then we'll talk about staffing, and that's really one of the benchmarking discussions you're going to need to have as it relates to programming. So um, those are some of the ones that, that met that lower quartile. Um, we look at distribution of these as well, and so we look at finding the gap. So when we say you need to start looking at providing more facilities within your community, or access to programs that you're providing, we look at where you're where you're able to get to those. And so the the standard is a 10 minute walk. You want to make sure that someone has access to some type of recreation um, within a 10 minute walk. So this evaluates. Um, where those gaps exist now. And so we're not saying go out and buy 
you necessarily have to go out and buy acreage, but we do say that you want to try and increase your connectivity of the resources you have. So it could be done through a trail. It could be done through adding a crosswalk. It could be done, um, we had a lot of conversations about just linking your um, park nodes that you have right now and those hubs that you have and just making sure, you know, could you look at all, uh, moving a bus route? So those are some of the recommendations um, in there to just increase access to some of the resources that you have in place. Um, these are some of the highlights, uh, and then I'm gonna discuss key takeaways and we'll open up for questions. Um, for land acquisition and development, that is the key takeaway probably, is linking the hubs that you have. You have a lot of wonderful resources. Um, one of the prime examples is, um, just getting across the street and having crosswalks to some of the parks that you already have. Making sure there's signage when you're driving by that you know that there's a park that's there. And so some of those park facilities that you have are beautiful and we want to make sure that people understand that those resources are there. So increasing access and land acquisition and park development include those types of conversations. Um, the other piece of that is redeveloping park master plans for some of your underutilized park resources. And so that is a conversation that we'd like to have um, with some of your older parks that aren't being used as much, um, especially in some of those key locations in downtown. Um, the facilities, um, there's, there's an extensive list there. I think I will go over the key takeaway there, which is just increased access to active recreation and tourism. And so that is part of that conversation you're already having with the 400 acre tract. A lot of the components that are in this list um, are things that were brought forward into that site plan. And so they go hand in hand, and I think that's, that's wonderful because you're already moving forward with the master plan before you've um, adopted it, just based on the, the way that that input aligned in these efforts and doing them simultaneously. Um, connectivity is really important. One of the elements that we, two, two elements that really stick out are um, the fact that you have this incredible blue way resource. You have a river, you have water access, and you've started this blue way system, and we want to make sure that you have the support services in place that people can use it. That's something that not just your community members will use, but people would come to Jacksonville to use. Um, and then the other thing is making sure that your internal park systems have connectivity. So that if someone's coming to visit, or if you're going to watch someone play soccer, you can actually walk around the park and get to the facilities within the park, and you can enjoy fitness and health and wellness around the park, and that makes the park more dimensional um, and, it, and increases your usage. Um, programs and expanding special events programming. By and large, in the survey, what we heard is people want more. Um, there is really strong support for health and wellness, um, for night and weekend activity. You have people that are working during the day and they want to have access to these programs in the evening. And so, uh, in addition to the special events, which usually occur on the weekend or in the evenings. And so, I put these next to each other because the part of the action item is to come up with a level of service goal. Where do you want to sit with that? In order to do some of those things, you have to increase your staff or you have to look at partnership agencies to provide some of those programs. And so in order to grow programming, um, we'll have to have continued conversations about um, you know, filling those gaps in order to meet that level of service need. And these are our key takeaways. Um, we look at the immediate need, so when you go in the action item section, which is the last section of the report, we look at immediate need, which is zero to two years, near term need, which is three to five years, and long term need, which is six to ten. And the things that are in your immediate need are things that were in really high demand, fell within a gap, or things we saw repeated from your last comprehensive plan that was ten years ago. and met those things. So um, those are those elements that fall in that zero to two um, range. So the facilities, I've, I feel like you're starting this conversation already with the 400 acre track. You're doing a really good job at moving forward with those conversations in that facilities list. Um, connectivity, talk to Anthony and Susan that the last time we met and, and you're already starting some of these greenway transportation 
and planning efforts to link some of these hubs. So I think that is also great because I, you have the resources in place if you can get people there. The land acquisition priorities to me right now are, are linking the parks in order to fill those gaps. Um, and then programs, the thing that stood out the most is people want access to programs in the nights and weekends. And then the staffing, the primary immediate goal is to set that level of service goal in order to figure out where you want to meet demand for programming. So those are our key takeaways and how the report is broken down. We put it um, graphically also. At the back of the report, you'll see the map and how some of these recommendations fall into um, the spaces throughout your community. And um, that these are listed out within the action items in the report. I'll leave it there, but it, I will open it up to any questions. If you have any questions on the content or um, the highlights that we talked about today, obviously, when you get in and you look at the report and you read it, we really encourage you to reach out to us or to Susan or to Michael or um, the, team, the, the staff to let us know if you have questions and need us to follow up with any detailed information. We got a question. Yeah. How was your outreach to the base? Did we, as far as the sample is concerned? So the sample did include people from the base, even though the project limits were the city not including the base, but it included residents within the city of Jacksonville. And we also had um, representatives from the base included in our stakeholder sessions. And there's a representative um, from the base on the advisory committee as well. Another question. In terms of your uh, the priorities, yeah. what does equity actually mean as far as the survey? So there's a definition of that in the front of the report, and it's quite extensive. We look at things. Um, a pretty broad range of information and it includes hours that the park is open. It includes do you have to pay to use the facility or the program? Um, can you get there? Is it physically linked to the rest of your system? So there's a, a pretty broad list of information and it, it, it even includes things like can you find access to the park online? There were a lot of gaps that we saw if someone wanted to go use a park and they didn't have a park map, for example. Um, that's an equity issue. We want to make sure that people have those resources um, available to them. So that's, that list is pretty broad, but it includes a, a wide range of elements to make sure that you are doing the best that you can to reach the most users. Sarah, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to chime in from the back row, but yeah, isn't that a federal standard type of thing that's used across the nation? Yeah, so we, the NRPA looks at um, different elements of, of equity, and it's grown, and I love that it's grown, the definition of it's grown, and the inclusivity of it's grown. And so we follow that practice and that evaluation when we look at the um, programs and facilities that you're providing. Yeah, that's where the definition came from. Other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate thank you. Mayor, like Sarah pointed out, so this, the, the goal of the presentation tonight is how we've been using most of our processes. You receive the information, digest it, then we'll bring it back. And this is such a big planning tool because it is how we're going to move forward for, I mean, at least a decade worth of, of planning processes for how we're going to address needs throughout the community as we, you know, every year we need to look back at the programs and the plans that the council adopts and approves for how we implement those not only into our operating budgets but into our capital planning. So one of the things, if you recall, that Wally pointed out to us with the CIP is now that we have this plan, when council approves a final plan, those items will then be implemented into the CIP. What you're seeing now in the CIP is projects that we've we've had throughout the past 10 years, and so we've moved those along. And a lot of that input and that maintenance goes back to Michael and Susan and how we keep moving these forward, but you do this process of getting community input so that if we're on the wrong track, 
we get redirected and we bring that information back to council. So um, I'm not sure if we bring this back at the next meeting or if we bring it back at the, at the first May meeting, but we'll bring it back to you. So any of those comments that you have, if it's something that you want us to get back over to, to Sarah, send it to us. We'll send it to her. If it's something you want from, from Michael or from Susan, just get that input and then we'll bring that back to the entire body so that you all have the same um, level of input and response back as you move forward and consider adoption. Thank Thanks, you, Mayor. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Talk a little bit about the annual report and so Mayor, we had tried to go longer, and I'd asked Sarah to speak longer <laughs> so that we didn't get into TDA tonight, but since we didn't do that effectively. Um, that's why I'm here. That's, that's why Anthony, Anthony's Anthony here. can take up the rest of I, I can. There, there are quite a few slides here. We're going to breeze through them pretty quickly, but before we transition, and I, I wish Sarah was still in here, but... Um, Sarah has actually done a lot of work for the city over the years. She's at least 15, maybe 16 years, worked on various projects for us, starting with the Lejeune Trail and, and the trail that we now have um, through the Memorial Gardens. She's done countless numbers of landscaping designs. She's a landscape architect by trade. Uh, so on the bypass, on Jacksonville Parkway, you know, all of that beautification that we've rolled out with Clean and Green, most of that design was done by her. And so it was great to have her a part of this planning exercise because we have a lot of trust and confidence in her. But all that aside, we are here to talk about tourism. And I think what you'll find here is that there's a lot of overlap between what you just heard and what you're getting ready to hear because tourism, recreation, all of that is intertwined. So just to kick us off here, we do have a new image. As of last Thursday, we have moved on from the Freedom Fountain uh, logo, and, and now we have the logos that are on the screen. So uh, I'm really proud of this because of the fact that these are homegrown. We did not hire a consultant to do this. Our media services department developed these, and. Uh, Josh is probably tired of the number of iterations that we went through, but, you know, I think we landed in a good place. It, al it also reflects, which I felt was really critical, it reflects the tie-in between the Tourism Development Authority and the city of Jacksonville. So you see the Osprey, you see the sun, you see the water. The colors, all of that is very reflective of what we see in the city seal. But excellent work by our media services team, and thank you for the directors for allowing us to move on. Um, let's talk about occupancy tax. And, and the reason I brought this up is, is this is just kind of a measure of health of tourism in our community. And you see a gigantic spike there in, in the middle, and that's certainly an outlier, but that was created by Hurricane Florence. And unfortunately, a lot of people lost their homes. We're living in hotels. We had contractors in for an extended period of time. But the blue line there are actual numbers. The orange, uh, the orange line there are, is the projection. And so you can see that we're moving in a very healthy direction from, a, from an occupancy tax revenue collection standpoint. That's going to allow us to do a lot more great things into the future. So several months ago, we, we hired a consultant to go out and, and do a survey. You know, we're interested in learning more about ourselves the way that others see us. And, and this is what we call a brand health survey, where we, we pull people outside of our market to, to, give the, to allow them to give feedback on what they know about Jacksonville, what they like about Jacksonville, all of that. And so we compiled all the results, and then we had a planning session several weeks ago with the directors as well as other stakeholders. And, and what you see here, on the screen, these are just four that I feel were kind of the highlights from our discussions, but opportunities for success, for success, arts and culture, sports and outdoor tourism, 
uh, military events and heritage and local hospitality. Those first two completely overlap with what we just talked about. And in fact, that first one is, is a way under tapped resource for our community, for sure. And you'll see us working on that more and more as we move forward with the, with the TDA. So we're going to talk about all our arts and culture. I've got some really great photos here. We're not going to dwell on, dwell on them, but the Veterans Pow Wow has been growing leaps and bounds. It's got national recognition. You know, Raquel just does an excellent job with that. If you get a chance to go, please attend. <laughs> Ollie Temple, these folks know how to have a good time. I'll tell you that. Um, they've been coming here for a long time, and they bring tons of people from out of town. They have their reunion, they also have their charity ball, and we'll continue to support them because they do bring overnight stays. Ola, the, the, we see this gentleman on the right-hand side, that stranger, but they came to us a year ago, wanted to do a festival, didn't have a clue on how to get started. We helped them. The attendance at their first event was 7,200 plus people, okay? So, you know, again, these cultural and art events are really blossoming. The, the Pacific Arts Festival had been ongoing for years, but they had growing pains. They didn't know how to get to a higher level of attendees. We helped them with social media, marketing, getting organized. We actually convinced them to move from Onslow Pines Park into the city of Jacksonville because of all the help that we've given them, and attendance is growing. So, you know, these are just great things that people from out of town get to come and enjoy in our community. Switching over to sports and tourism, and really one point that I failed to make when we, really, when we first got started here, all of these successes are based upon partnerships. We don't do any of this alone. You know, Mr. Warden and Mr. Jackson will tell you that what we do is appropriate resources to people who want to do great things. And those are the results that you're seeing here. Go back. Could you go back one? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you want to bring up anything about the stage? Yes. Well, one of the investments that we're looking to make in the, in the near future, hopefully next fiscal year, is to purchase a, a portable stage. It's kind of a transformer type thing where it folds and unfolds. Uh, we want to have that for city events, but we also want to have that to be able to offer to our partners to help drive down the overhead of actually producing their events, allowing them to reinvest those funds into making a larger and, and more successful event. That's a huge piece. Anybody who's ever been involved in planning any kind of festival knows that that stage, just getting there a long time ago, many, many moons ago, we could get one from MCCS. That is no longer That's an option. That's not an option. And so, you know, the whole community felt the loss of that opportunity, and then you have to go try to find a private contractor to deliver you one to town from not here. <laughs> so the costs are prohibitive. So they're that's, very, very expensive yeah. to rent. Let's they're just really say. Are. And you really can't have a great event, especially an outdoor event, without something covered where you're going to have equipment, mm -hmm. sound, microphones, performances. It's just an essential piece. So that's well, a... Absolutely. That's why TDA is, that's why TDA is investing in, in that, yeah, too. Right. Just for the very reasons you said, so... All right, moving into sports and outdoor tourism. A lot of these are connected to uh, the Sports Commission and the work that they do, and we've invested in them more over the past couple of years. ECI is one that's been ongoing forever, okay? And when I talk to Scott, if, I've, if I hear once from him, if we have the facility or when we have the facility, if I hear it once, I hear it 100 times every time we speak to him. This is an event that would benefit. It's maxed out now. They added four teams this year. They can't fit anymore in the space. Uh, New River Splash, we helped them become a sanctioned NC triathlon event, okay? That was last year, and it really helped to professionalize the event, but then it also allowed uh, New River Splash to become the state championship this year. Uh, Carolina Gloves is a second year event that we were able to bring in from Fayetteville. Hundreds of boxers from all over the country, really all over the world, they come internationally. Uh, this is a regional qualifying event, so a lot of folks who are hopeful for the Olympic team, they'll come through this tournament. 
and I hear you say this was our second biggest. This is the second largest event behind the ECI and in, in year two. And the majority of the individuals coming have overnight stay. Absolutely. I, I can't remember what the actual numbers are, but it's something like 90%, you know. May I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Related to overnight stays specifically. I know overnight stays have always been kind of the gold standard for how tourism dollars and effectiveness has been measured, but there's a whole component we're missing. I know that there was some discussion at one time about looking at other spending, mm -hmm. not just literally overnight stays. Is that something still in exploration or oh, consideration in mean, progress in that ring? When you look at events like this from a pure economic development perspective, then you've got to look at the whole picture. Uh, the reason that we've traditionally looked at overnight stays is because that's easy to track. Mm -hmm. Well, in most, in some cases, it's easy to track. And of course, that's where we get the revenue to help support our, our efforts. But, you know, as we kind of mature in our partnerships and these things grow and we get more data, we'll be able to report back on total economic impact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of those connections you look at with the restaurants, mm -hmm. and you try and have that dialogue directly with the restaurant because they'll be able to do it. You can't track your own sales tax that detailed uh, coming through the state and the distribution. It creates a challenge. You can do it, but it's it's more difficult to make that happen. So as Anthony's talked about uh, previously, the goal is to have, like we have the hoteliers, they can give us direct information, but if we talk to McDonald's, McDonald's can say, hey, during this weekend, we had this many, uh, this many people coming in that we usually have this number. And so we try and track some of those trends. We see it a lot with Chick-fil-A as they're a partner on a lot of these events. And so they can track it. When we start bringing that number back in, then you really see more of that total economic impact. You've got to think every time we get an economic impact analysis now, we're really only focusing on what the, the room impact yeah, is. And it, sometimes you factor in a smaller number that says X number of dollars per person based on that. But when we start seeing the direct impact, one of the things you'll see on the revenue stream this year for the sales tax is roughly a 7 8% increase. It doesn't just happen because all of a sudden, <coughs> Mr. Sosa decided to go see NC State play. It happens because we have all of these events that are showing up. Over time, that's a big number. And so that's how, going back to the mayor's question of how do you maintain our compensation plan and the growth that Sarah's talking about in all of our services and the staffing we're going to need, as we say, this is that revenue stream. This is how it's created. And that stage, whatever that stage cost, will be paid for after two or three events because we're going to have that exponential uh, growth and that's where we talk about all those things inside of our uh, master planning you're going to see revenue impacts that that are going to keep going so when yeah, does well, the county kind of i mean looking at spikes during those times to be able, i know we're not getting all that's another story all together all of what we get we need to get from sales tax but i was wondering the sales tax the spikes during those different events if we could kind of they look yes, at the, the way they're going to get them, though, they're going to get them on quarters yes. and then they break it down on months. So to get the drill down, you don't typically from the state's version, you don't get a drill down that shows a monthly day to day kind of tracking. You can get it and you can request some of those dollars. It just it's you might as well pass uh, uh, something about uh, increasing your quarter cent sales tax at the state level, right? There's there's challenges on the staffing side at the state level to get that level of information. So anytime you get a quarterly distribution. Yeah, they're collecting information in those different increments, you know, what gets sent to the county, what gets distributed, as opposed to what a marketing company would do in analyzing it. And that's where really we probably ought to look at what companies collect sales information and, and go at it that way to see when a weekend you know, at a big surge. And then. Would Buxton be of any service to that? Well, they actually, help with that. Yeah. Right, and, and we've looked at several. You recall the conversations. They're very expensive, and uh, the technology is evolving quickly. So I, I feel like we're going to be in that business, but essentially buying data. What, what it is is buying data from a company that collects it. Um, 
I think we're going to be in that business. We just haven't found the right one yet. And, and that's where all of our partners, and that's the key thing. If you're going to go get that information, there's others that benefit from it, and they're the ones that ought to join with us and subscribe, and then we'd all be able to measure you know, in our own areas. And even if we only take a sample of, let's say we pull out five partners, mm -hmm. and maybe they're food, or maybe maybe it's Dick's Sporting Goods, and we just ask them, hey, what happens during a during a high tournament weekend that JASA brings in somebody? They can give us those numbers and show us, here's our spike, and that's something we can pull in that, that we start looking at. Because remember, when we're talking about financing big projects, those numbers are going to be something we want to factor in for what's that what's that delta what's that increase that we're using to make those things those things happen once we get into businesses like this too USSS a NC baseball so it's essentially a baseball organization um, and you start to see 50 to 80 teams in town you'll see that on the street regardless of what the numbers are, tell, are telling you you know, and, and this is a great opportunity. Susan came back in. This is a great opportunity to point out that our partnerships aren't just external. You know, we're doing, I feel, a much better job of partnering internal to help advance a lot of these things where we haven't necessarily done that in the past. And it has required a lot of flexibility on everyone's part because if we're bringing in a, a, a baseball tournament that has 80 teams, then that means we can't have kickball on Sunday. And so kickball has to go somewhere else. And so just to point out that it is an intricate thing and it requires a lot of coordination. But this is a new event this year. Uh, they're looking at seven regional baseball tournaments, one of them being a national scale tournament. Uh, that's going to be on July 12th through 14th, 50 to 80 teams. So, this is brand new. They, the reason they wanted to come to Jacksonville, the Commons is excellent, and it's right next to Western Boulevard where all the hotels and restaurants are. Those are the amenities that we have to offer. And if you remember back to what Victus was saying about what, a, what made us a great destination, Western Boulevard with the hotels and the restaurants was a key, key aspect. Uh, Frogman 3D Bow Hunters Challenge 5K. This is a locally grown event. This will be the first one that we're going to have on the 500 acre, or excuse me, 400 acres. We're actually clearing the trail now. It's a 3D bow hunting competition with a 5K associated, and it's actually an event that's in memorial of, of several, a number of, of uh, Navy SEALs who died in Afghanistan, one of them being a local resident who went to White Oak High School. And this one, I had to put this one in for Mr. Jackson. He turned his baseball cap around on me the other, the other day at the TDA meeting. World Series arm wrestling. Who would have ever thought, right? This is a real thing. And that's coming to Jacksonville, Southeast Regional on July 27th. So it, it doesn't have to just be basketball, baseball, you know, the traditional stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of activities that we have the ability to, to, to bring in. We continue to partner with MCCS because they don't have the ability to market outside the base. And, you know, uh, with, a, with a half marathon as well as the Engineers Challenge participation has been great. And then can't say enough about uh, the level of support that the directors have offered for the Ospreys. There have been a lot of improvements out there at Jack Hamiet. I think you're going to be really happy. That's another internal partnership. We're stretching the dollar by doing the work in-house and just making that a, a great facility to go see some baseball. So military events and heritage, one of the things that we learned from our study was is that that's a very large and beloved part of our community, but it may not necessarily be as appealing for folks who are looking to come and visit. It's something that we still want to pursue, but it's not going to be the headline. We're looking at sports, outdoors, all art and culture as the headlines. Uh, we're working with the Museum of the Marine. They're getting ready to have their groundbreaking in May. I think it was the 17th. So it's probably on your calendar. They've got their lease approved and that project is moving forward. We we'll also continue to work with the Montford Point Marines. They had such a great experience last year when we showed them 
some added hospitality at the country club and, and some other things, that instead of going out of town for their reunion this year, they're going to stay here two consecutive years, maybe more. So that's just another great thing to, to have here in our community. We continue to support Veterans Tribute. We're adding, we added an audio tour to the Memorial Gardens. You may or may not be aware of. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's Colonel Massey right there on the right hand side. Right. And yeah, he's in, and, army. in his white uniform. There's a story behind that. You should ask him. Oh, I know. It. But uh, <laughs> the audio tour, we're putting up permanent signs in the very near future. It's an excellent addition. Uh, self-guided tour, and then the Walk of Honor. Uh, Dr. Washington, you just pointed out the signs. Brings up a question: uh, bathrooms out there. What's what's status of that? They had the pre-bidding pre-bid meeting today. Okay. So the project is funded, it's designed, and it's out for bid. I don't know when the bids are due. I think it's April twenty-third. The so bids are due. So, yes, that is moving forward as well. Red White Salute was a great success last year. We changed it up a little bit from years prior where we had a live band. We actually had a beer garden this time, which is very unique uh, for city-sponsored events. People, I mean, they just loved it. So we had the concert with 20 Ride, excellent band, and then after we had the Laser Light Show, which just concluded a wonderful evening. This is one that our recreation department and our parks department have to put a lot of effort into uh, to make it a success. Now, shifting gears to local hospitality, you know, it's not something that, um, it's definitely not something that we've taken for granted, but it's not something that we've recognized as much until after the branding survey. Uh, people feel that we are a very um, kind and welcoming community. That's basically what it says. They feel that Jacksonville is a safe place to come and visit. And, you know, the crossover between art and culture and hospitality here with the International Food Trail, that has been a, a great success uh, locally as, as well as at the statewide level. Uh, we've all heard of the Waffle Lady. Mm -hmm. So not only recognizing the businesses, but the people I'm not sure if you've seen the commercials with the Waffle Lady with Paris Hilton. They had a whole Hilton campaign with our Waffle Lady, which is amazing to watch. Um, and then we also had a day at the NC State Fair to showcase some of our culinary, um, some of our culinary talent, as well as some of the other aspects of, of Jacksonville. And of course, too, we celebrate um, the leaders, the hospitality leaders in our community. Two years in a row, um, employees from Jacksonville have been selected for um, NCRLA stars of the industry. Just this past year, Zaya Mora from the Hampton Inn and Suites was selected as one of the NC Lodging Managers of the Year. There were two selected. Okay, and to point out here, the other people who end up on stage are from like the Duke Hotels and you know the fancy ones in Pinehurst, Raleigh, and yeah, yes, yeah. Pinehurst, and and so we have something special here in our people. The state recognizes it, recognizes it, and so it's just an excellent thing for us to to show to the to the world. With that, it's basically the end of the presentation. I did want to flag the brand new website here. It's been updated in the past year. It's got lots of great information on it, attractive images, much more modern than the one we had before. And certainly can't walk away without plugging some of our upcoming events. You'll see these on the website. Um, you'll also see them on the calendar that goes out um, do we put these in the management report? Well, they, yes, and they also are in the uh, water and sewer. That's correct. Water and sewer building. So we try to spread the word on these as much as possible. You see other cultural events in there that I didn't mention before, Filipino Fiesta. Um, uh, the other one that comes to mind is the uh, FTM Fashion Week. You know, there's just lots, again, lots of great stuff going on. So, Mayor, that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions that you might have.
questions of Anthony. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Thank you for that very thorough report. Very good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep moving around. I guess you have some one city moments. I do have some one city moments. I think Anthony left me a few minutes. If you don't mind, I'll gladly. Um, but there's the good thing about it is there's a lot going on and there's a lot of positive energy in and around the community. Uh, we have Community Development Week, which is uh, is going on. Uh, very exciting to see that. And we got a few slides with Community Development Week. You'll see here part of uh, what we do in community development is we're making an impact and we're making a change. So the best way to see that is look at the before and look at the after and and that's just step one you know the next step after is we go back in and potentially build a, a new house on these sites and then the next step after that is we start home ownership training for citizens and we get them in to the new houses so we go from a, a dilapidated piece of property to new homeowners inside of our community you're going to see the structures um, since last year we've had uh, you know a hundred different uh, sites that we've reviewed and, and visited. The city's removed 173 structures with the use of CDBG funds and um, city general funds. Uh, it's very impressive and it shows we're very active in what we're doing. Uh, here's some home ownership. We have 427 and 429 Myrtle Ward Circle. You'll know that inside of Country Cup Villas. Uh, we've been working on that. This year we have uh, two other properties that we're working on, 112 and 114 Cox Avenue. Those are three bedroom, two bath facilities that we're working with our people to get them through the home ownership process and get them into these uh, these individual houses. And it's very exciting uh, to be able to, to have that process. Here's that 113 and 114 Cox Avenue. Uh, during this time, you know, the CD week is something where we, we not only appreciate the projects that we call community development projects, but we appreciate community enrichment projects. And that's really what our Neighborhood Improvement Services does. Uh, and it, as Anthony said, there's a bigger team, not just inside the city, but the community partners as well to help make uh, make all these things happen. You'll see right here earlier today, uh, Tracy and Pam were able to receive the proclamation for uh, CD week that, uh, that the mayor signed. And, and this week, we're also gonna have our appreciation luncheon. I think a couple members of council are gonna show up and help us serve some food on Thursday? Thursday. 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 Uh, down at uh, Public Services will be down there. So uh, exciting to see our partners and be active. The other side here is uh, Harmony Week. So in a Harmony Grant Celebration, our youth council works together every year with Pam Trafton, and they go through awarding funds to local nonprofits. So the youth council does a similar thing that we do within our CDBG funds, and the council does every year, and they review applications and they hand out funds to local nonprofits uh, to help them with their activities. Very exciting to see uh, the Harmony program stay active. You apply funds in the fiscal year budget to go towards helping the youth council. Um, you know, we see some things in the youth council this year that Pam Trafton's been able to do to get them engaged and keep them energized. Uh, this is uh, part of the youth council giving out those funds and being active within the community. If we teach our youth now how to be active with our nonprofits, hopefully they'll join nonprofits in the future and they'll see how philanthropy can make it uh, an effective outreach for multiple members. Week of the Young Child, it's coming up um, April 6th through the 12th. I was waiting for, for JoJo just to say it out loud, but he didn't give me that. So week of the 6th through the 12th, the week of the young child is all about providing resources to young children and the families. We have a lot of partners in the community that are engaged in these efforts. Our recreation team, our parks team, uh, one place, uh, Zing Zone Children's Museum, Onslow County Library, those are all partners that work through this week and throughout the entire year to, uh, to provide services because we understand the need for 
young children and families to be interactive and to, and to stay active is important for their growth and development. As we talk about one city, it's all ages. It, it definitely starts as young as we can go. Chief Unero tells us all the time that the only way to make an impact down the line is to make an impact at, at kids from, from zero to three. I think that's the age that he throws out to us. And so you'll know that for the one place dollars that, that the council will consider uh, appropriate again this year, $333,000, the reason that you do that is because it's gonna make a positive impact on our community. You'll see the picture here from earlier where the proclamation uh, that the mayor signed and uh, we were able to get a team in as we focus on the week of the young child. And it's, as I said, next week, the sixth, through the 12th. The Chill Zone, that's our teen center, grand opening, happened last week. Uh, you'll see a couple of our council members here on the right. I'm not sure if they played the video games or not, but they, <laughs> they showed up. And if you didn't play the video games, then you're missing out on an opportunity. Um, I'm also not sure how they got in after 12 o'clock because uh, no people older than 17 can get in there. I don't know your age, but I'm just saying if you're older than 17, you're not supposed to go. Uh, we're real excited. This is a great outreach effort from our recreation team. You see this back. Uh, the teens 12 to 17 have their own arcade. They have their own performance stage. They have snacks that are affordable. These arcade games are 25 cent games. For anybody that knows an arcade game, that hadn't happened in about 40 years. Yeah. And it's yeah. happening right across the street downtown. And it's, a, it's an excellent outreach effort. Uh, we kicked it off during spring break week to give kids the opportunity to be there. Just as, as amazing as that is, popcorn, hot dogs, drinks, other snacks, all for a dollar. So it's affordable for our kids to be able to go. Theoretically, they could take four dollars over, play some games, have a snack, and, and not break the bank, and maybe they could go back twice. So uh, I'll tell you, if you go shoot on that basketball goal, it's a really tough rim. Uh, so uh, it, I think it's rigged, but maybe these two tried it out and they did better. Like I'm just saying. <laughs> Say, man, I think I'm going to keep that. I'm just going to go into that. But you see that the energy that, that went into developing out this site, it was all centered on our teens. It wasn't created by, by old folk sitting around a table who said, hey, this is the best idea. It was created by our teens, our youth council. You'll see Pam Traft in there in that picture as well. Um, you know, an integral part of putting together the, the system here is to say, we're getting that input. And then we're listening to what they want as we move forward. And I think that's really exciting uh, to give our teens the opportunity to have a space that after school, they're not going there to necessarily do their homework or do a program. They're going there to chill, which is all they do these days is chill factor. And so if they're going to be sitting on their cell phone for hours, we want them to do it right there, looking at another person and have the opportunity to engage in a, in a positive environment. So you see it there's video games on the walls mm -hmm. if there's a big basketball game coming up then they could watch them on these uh, TVs whenever that happens I think the season's over but uh, they can watch these events or something with these beanbag chairs uh, right here so um, so that's all a lot of positive things that are going on within the community. And the, the last thing that we want to share mayor is remembering our very own uh, General Al Gray um, General Gray passed away um, on the 20th, and at the age of 95, if you'll recall, we celebrated his 95th birthday here in town, and it was an honor to, to be able to have this type of uh, a leader in our community. Not only was he the 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, he was also commander of the 2nd Marine Division uh, in 1983. And for those of you that have been here longer, uh, you know General Gray is a person that's active in the community uh, every single day. And so for us to have the opportunity to, to, to remember him, to honor him, and even now just to say thank you is just a testament to, uh, to the city of Jacksonville, to the Marine Corps, and to the family that is, is our city. And I think it's a, it's, it's a blessing to have leaders in our community that consistently show up whenever they're needed 
and they show up whenever there's a voice that's needed to, to push something in the right direction. General Gray was uh, instrumental in pushing forward for the Museum of the Marine for the last 20 plus years. There's a reason there and there's you're going to see a lot of him and, and multiple things uh, in the museum moving forward and, and I think that's awesome. So uh, just as we remember General Gray and 95 years of, of wonderful service and of life, he is part of, of Jacksonville and he's definitely part of our city. That'd be missed. Yeah. And so here's earlier today, um, these folks gathered together as a uh, proclamation that the mayor issued in remembrance of uh, General Al Gray and for a lifetime of service and a lifetime of, of honor. Uh, so it's great. Uh, mayor had an active day. I think that may have been the point when I, I was taking fun of uh, Brent's hair there. Brent <laughs> 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 looks like he's about 95. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough day out there. So. Uh -huh. messing with you know, and the last thing I'll say, Mayor, that even with Mr. Sosa's wonderful comments, is some of us are representing NC State today as we as we push forward a, a strong North Carolina program, and we support this team. Thank heavens that other school didn't win that game because we couldn't stand behind them, but we'll stand behind <laughs> NC State. You're talking about the University of North Carolina New Jersey? That's yes, right. <laughs> We're going to stand behind the men and women of North Carolina State uh, University as they go and try and win a national championship and bring that home in basketball. So good for all of them. That's us, Mayor. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All right. All right.